Um, so with all these years of experience globally, internationally, you know, um, for your town, um, how has, uh, I would ask this question twofold, you know, what, it, what was your favorite learning? Or maybe you could answer the question as, you know, um, how has a failure or a parent failure set you up for later success? So yeah. do you have like a favorite, yeah. favorite failure or learning that you'd like to share with us? Well, yeah, I, I was, you know, in Japan, and I, I already just used a, a similar analogy for this, but I remember I was a young kind of brash kind of American who came into Japan and was, and I was leading an all 100% Japanese organization. And one, and one, uh, one day the, the, the executive in charge of all manufacturing in Japan pulled me in his office and he said, um, you got a second, I want to talk to you. And so um, he, he took out of his desk a piece of rope and he laid it on his desk. And he said, what happens when you push a rope? And it doesn't go anywhere, right? It just bunches up. He said, but what happens when you pull a rope? And it goes wherever you want. If you pull it up, it'll go up. If you pull it down, it'll go down. He said, in Japan, you pull, you don't push. And, and he was advising me that in a, a real lesson from my career in Asia, that if you want to lead an organization in Asia, you have to tell them what great looks like. You have to show them what you want to do and pull them up. You don't sit there and tell them, do this, do that, do this, do that. You just basically tell them where you want to go and how, how those things um, you know, will make this everything better. And then you get everybody will, will, will beat, a, will beat a, a, a beat the feet to your door. Another example was I was in uh, Korea and the chief executive officer of LG, um, I remember I was there for about a month and I was trying, I was telling people all the things that you know, we should go work on and do and nothing was happening, nothing was happening. And I went to the CEO and I said, I, I'm trying to understand how things work here. And he said, he said, you're not asking it the right way. He said, you should ask for a teardown rebuild. And there's a Korean word for it, um, TDR, it's a Japanese uh, uh, term. And, um, and, and I said, a TDR? He said, yeah, you ask for a TDR and it'll happen. So I went and I, 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 resh I reshaped all the same questions I had, to, things I wanted to look at, like cost this or cost that or whatever. And um, I asked, I said, I like a TDR and sure enough, a team, a TDR is a team of group of people that get together and work on a problem together. Uh, where in America, you might ask somebody to go do something. Uh, in Korea, it had to be a team. And so you had to have a team solution in order to get something done. So, so you, you know, you learn that every culture and every environment has different ways of executing things and, and how to operate, you know, the nuances between different uh, cultures. Um, and, you know, then I went to another foreign country called California um, when, I, when I went out, when I went there. And obviously very, very different. You know, um, you know California workforce is, you know, more akin to herding cats um, because, you know, everybody's strong and independent and has their own ideas and wants to do things a certain way. So you have to facilitate your management style to accommodate um, getting things done in, uh, in that environment. So innovation and things like that are very important in California, especially in Silicon Valley. And so you have to facilitate a way by which innovation uh, and, and those values can kind of come through in your management style. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's different. You know, Singapore, I was there for a long time and you know, that was very structured, very disciplined, very almost military style um, in terms of the, 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 the culture. So every country, everything's different. Um, people talk about, you know, you know, the challenges in China or the challenges in Europe. And you just have to, I think, understand the nuances of a culture and fit into it. You, you know, um, you know, when I always say culture is like the wind, right? You, you can stand there and say the wind is, I'm, I'm stopping the wind. No, you're not stopping the wind. The wind is just going around you. <laughs> you feel you're like you're stopping the wind, but really the wind is just going around you. And culture is like that. Culture is like the wind. It just, you have to make sure that you're going with it uh, and not trying to go against it. Yeah, well, those those are great stories with different country, even in different regions, right? Bringing a different culture element. And uh, I suppose as a, a global supply chain executives, you know, you would have a lot of opportunity to experience those. Um, so if you would, uh, uh, what is your favorite place in all of those places that you have traveled and worked? 
I, I would say from a heart standpoint, Japan, uh, from a head standpoint, maybe Singapore, um, from a job standpoint, probably Korea, just because, you know, the Korea system of execution is so superior. Um, it's so, so well aligned. The Japanese have a word called Hoshin Kanri or even Hoshin Kenrai, uh, uh, Tenkai, which is really alignment of a management system so that when the top says, do something, the bottom is doing it by the end of the day. Um, in the United States, if the top says do something, you'll be on Monday, you'd be lucky if it's starting by Friday. So, you know, I think it, it you, you know, there's different, different ways that management system, but they're all good in their own way. They're all different in their own way, um, but not, you know, not unusual. I also spent most of a year in the, in the, in, for IBM, in Central America, I was in Barbados. Intel had an, actually a manufacturing plant there, believe it or not. And I was sent down there to be a program manager for the factory. And I remember showing up at the factory there. They started at like 7.30 in the morning. And then at, by three o'clock in the afternoon, it was over. The factory was closed. It was done the day because everybody had to go home and you know go to the beach or go relax. I mean, so culture is a huge, I mean, I was used to, wait a minute, where'd everybody go, right? Three o'clock, you know, the day's half over. Um, and, and so I think, you know, you just, you learn that you have to, uh, you have to understand it and you have to go with that, with, with, with that flow because you can't resist it, it won't work. Yeah, interesting. And maybe we can also later on explore some of the geo uh, tension, you know, we're dealing with and a lot of this related to culture as well. Before that, I actually like to share the result. We have the poll question on the screen. And then um, are you able to see the result? The first question mm -hmm. is, uh, what is your understanding of supply chain, right? It's a multiple choice question. So we have logistic and transportation, supplier network, manufacturing, procurement, demand planning, inventory management, uh, strategic sourcing, cost management, or all, all, all above. So as you can tell that the answer is widely spread it. So there's many different words, you know, it's almost some people use it as a substitute for a supply chain. And many of this may be, you know, representative of what supply chain does, maybe also a core function. So um, that's a very interesting just a way, you know, for people to um, perceive, you know, what supply chain does. And so supply yeah. chain has uh, been a living system, right, in our daily life for more than 100 years. However, most people didn't pay attention to its significance until 2020, when the pandemic disrupted the global supply chain from food availabilities to household necessities to medical essentials. To compare and contrast, people are generally aware and even knowledgeable about the industrial revolution and globalization. For example, we're in the fourth industrial revolution and the era of globalization 4.0. So question for you, Tom, in your opinion, why didn't supply chain gain popularity until now? Well, I, I think, you know, part of it was, um, it's, it, it's very, very similar to, you know, manufacturing. I mean, manufacturing really did, the industrial revolution is what started manufacturing and how, you know, people like Henry Ford and others actually created um, you know, mass, um, mass customization of automobiles, right? First, first mass production and followed by now mass customization. So I, I think business evolves. And I think, you know, right now supply chain is all of a sudden the connecting tissue between a global economy. And, uh, you know, when it was primarily the United States producing for the United States or Europe for Europe, maybe wasn't as big of a deal. Um, but as the economies have expanded and become more integrated, I think supply chain just rose to the top, just naturally. It just became um, more important. Um, and, and even now, I was listening to the news this morning about the issues around Ukraine and Europe and Russia. And right now, they're so integrated, um, you know, between, you know, what goes into Russia and what comes out of Russia that, uh, you know, a war would basically cause problems for everybody. Um, it's nobody, it's a non-winnable war. So, so I think the, you know, it, I think that's true of supply chain. And, and I think, you know, whether or not, you know, supply chains become weaponized in the future because they're that important, you know, people will use them um, um, as a way of, of, you know, of dominating somebody else. Um, I, we're already seeing that in corporate world. I mean, supply chains win um, when those companies have excellent supply chains and supply chains lose, or companies lose when supply chains are weak. So. So I, I think it just 
evolutionary. I think you know supply chains just have evolved now to the point where they're more important. Mm. I also like to spend some time talking about modernized supply chain. You know, for our conversation today. So you co-authored the book, The Living Supply Chain. And could you tell us more about the book and why you chose the word "the living" to describe supply chain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's uh, there were some um, acronyms involved, but but the real the real premise behind it was um, supply chains can collapse or or succeed based upon how well balanced they are. A good example of it is remember when Samsung Galaxy phone had its issues, you know, going back probably five seven years ago. Um, those phones, um, actually, when they pulled the Galaxy phone out of production for about a year, the supply chain that was supporting that phone collapsed, right? Because all the companies that were building the parts, the screens, the printed circuit boards, the batteries, and all that stuff, all of a sudden, they weren't shipping any product. And, and, and all of a sudden, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, when you take the wolves out of Montana, right? The elk eat all the trees and all of a sudden then they starve to death because there's too many elk and not enough food supply. So this, this idea of balance in supply chains is so important and all the more reason why, you know, I think you need to have balance in you, you, the number of sharks or OEMs that you have and the number of, you know, if you think about semiconductor people and um, no insult meant, meant for semiconductor companies, but they're like fish, right? They actually are feeding the the, the products with parts. And so, you know, now why did things become unbalanced? Because it's unbalanced because the semiconductor guys didn't have enough parts to feed the, the sharks. And some of the sharks are dying out because they can't get enough fish. So, so it's, it's OEMs and it's a structure and it's balanced. And when it's unbalanced, you've got supply chain issues. And when it's balanced, you have thriving uh, economies and thriving companies. So, so the living concept is really that biological analogy to what's healthy and what's not and how efficient companies can be and how, 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 how effective they can be is, is taking care of their suppliers, you know, treating them correctly um, and suppliers treating their customers correctly and then planning and integrating their thinking and, and you know, the supply demand story needs to be well planned. I mean, right now, I mean, one of the major reasons, you know, semiconductor companies are running out of parts is because electrification of uh, vehicles and the, 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 the epidemic, to use a word, um, amount of utilizations now for a connected uh, economy. I mean, you got streetlights talking to stoplights and you got stoplights talking to cars and you got everything is connected. So the, what that semiconductor is, and, and yet we all knew that was going to happen. And yet the amount of supply or the amount of investment necessary to go after that demand just never was made at the right time. So now you have an imbalance and things are not healthy. And, you know, so anyway, that's the living biological uh, analogy. <clears throat> mm. So as a living phenomenon for more than a century, right? And by the way, it's across every industry and it's a global scale. So there is an essential and intangible property in the supply chain whether you call it energy, a spirit, a spirit, a soul. So supply chain professionals sense its presence. So do their partners and customers. It inspires people to contribute their talent, commitment, and foster a sense of belongings and mutual purpose. So Tom, from your experience, what is the soul of supply chain? You know, I, you know, it, if there is a soul in supply chain, it's, you know, I mean, people have mentioned that, you know, a soul is really what the heart and the head are doing together, right? Um, and for me, you know, the heart is, the heart of a supply chain is the clock speed, the beat, the heartbeat. I mean, the heart is pumping the blood through the system, right? So it's a rhythm. It's, it's, it's the daily um, speed and in, in, in the, the processes and the capabilities that actually drive the the heart to pump the blood through the system. But the design of the supply chain really is coming from the head, right? I mean, you know, how did airports decide to use hubs? How did railroad stations to, you know, lay themselves out the way they laid themselves out? The, the, the infrastructure, the, you know, the national highway system. I mean, the, how are things organized and how are they designed? That comes from the head. So the supply chain has also got to have the, the head or the design um, as well as the clock speed, the rhythm, the beat of the business, um, you know, the, the rhythm of the business in order to, to work. So if there's a soul, 
it's the combination of how things are designed and how things flow and how things work together in that context. And, and in that way, you actually have um, a moving um, ecosystem, right? You have a moving, um, uh, efficiently moving system. You know, you know right now, um, um, I, I co-authored an article in June called Our Pan-American uh, Manufacturing Ecosystem in the Harvard Business Review. And what really it pointed out was something very profound. I mean, Russia, uh, uh, China, you know, just uh, had a train move from, you know, Beijing all the way to Paris this past week, um, um, just really highlighting the connectivity of Europe and, and, and Asia. But yet you cannot even ride a bicycle or, or a motorcycle um, between, you know, Alaska and Puerto del Fuego um, on the southern tip of South America. You know, there's no way down there. We are unconnected. The North American continent and the South American content, the continent are unconnected. That's a shame. We've got to figure out how to do that. We need a Pan American, um, you know, supply chain ecosystem if we're going to thrive 50 years from now. So this concept of, you know, design and and and, and speed and movement, I think, is it's just table stakes. It's almost it, it, it's the underlying theory of of how the supply chain needs to be executed in the in the next century. And if we want to th survive and thrive, we're going to have to figure out how to do that better. Uh, we can't be flying things at high cost and all the carbon involved. We can't be putting things on a slow boat from China for 30 days. These things are just not, not going to advance supply chains. They've got to be faster. They've got to be more regional. They've got to be more local. And they've got to be you know, done in a way that actually you know, facilitates you know, the reduction in carbon, which is driving climate change. So, I mean, all those things. Mm -hmm. That's a short answer to a very complicated. <laughs> it is a very complex uh, ecosystem as well as the challenges that we're facing uh, forward looking might be different, you know, from compared to the last 30 years. Before we jump into some of the details, I'd love to share this result. You know, we asked the audience the question, does supply chain have a soul? And it's a single choice uh, question. So, you know, 46% answered yes, 13% answered no. And a 42% answered maybe. So <laughs> <laughs> it's a, by the way, it's a real topic now, you know, whether we have a soul for supply chain. So that's uh, very interesting. Thanks no, that, that's about right. I, I, I've met, I've met a lot of people who um, basically don't have a soul. So that matches. So. <laughs> yeah. so very interesting. Hopefully this is the beginning of a many conversation we may have around this topic. Mm -hmm.